And ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to bring up our senior pastor, Mike Palumpo. Thanks, Jeff. Would you give th uh, Jeff a big hand for doing a great job with those announcements? And thank you, Jeff. And it is always great to be back in Haleiwa again. Last time I was here, it was hot. So I scheduled myself to come when it's cool. So now it feels so good. It feels so good in here. This is awesome. And, uh, and of course, um, Pastor Glenn and Pastor Teresa and a few of the other members of the team are in Portland. And I've been getting like text messages from them all morning. And it's blowing up in Portland right now. I mean, there are people that are coming forward for an altar call and they're coming to Christ. And so people are coming to Jesus in, in Portland at a business conference. I mean, who would have thought? There's a great picture of uh, Nate, and he's praying with um, someone from his team that's coming to the Lord, like, you know, that, that just happened this morning. So, praise God. Amen. That's awesome things are going on. And, uh, and of course, we um, had this amazing time with the Holdren family this past weekend. I know we all miss Kimo, who was a part of your campus, who went to be with the Lord um, just two days after we had the Labor Day picnic. And uh, I still remember the first time I saw him, or the last time I saw him, was we were at the picnic, and um, I was talking with a, a bunch of guys, and so he, he was just walking in front of me, and he said, well, I'll see you, Pastor Mike. And I have this picture of him just waving at me like that and saying goodbye, and I had no idea that would be the last time that I would ever see him, because two days later, um, he would take a nap and not wake up. And so we just had this uh, funeral just this past weekend. It was, it was so powerful. The, the, the testimonies of how he had touched so many people's lives were just so powerful. Because he came to Christ at our church and got baptized in the year 2000, uh, right over there across from Jameson's, you know, the, um, the Kiavi tree. So we baptized him right there. And then who, who would have thought that we would spread his ashes pretty much on the same beach at Elise yesterday? And that was such a beautiful, beautiful time. And um, someone was so moved by his testimony that they gave their, he gave his heart to Jesus um, on Friday night at the funeral. So that was really, really wonderful. I led, I led the whole group, the gang in the prayer. And then the next day I found out from um, one of the sisters, she says, Pastor Mike, I'm so glad that you led the whole group in prayer because m my dad just, and he's, you know, he's a, Older guy, he's kind of proud, you know, and, you know, etc. having some hard time. But when he heard, you know, Kimo's testimony and, um, and then you led the whole group in prayer, he was praying and he was breaking down like in tears and it was very, very powerful. So I think, you know, knowing Kimo, he would be blessed to know that people came to Christ at his funeral. I mean, that would... I mean, that's, that's sort of how I would like it for mine. <laughs> Just turn it into a revival. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, go ahead and take your notes out. And we've been doing this series called Just Walk Across the Room. And that's kind of what we've been doing this past weekend is walking across the room to introduce people to the greatest person ever, Jesus. Amen? And then over in Portland, Rosiers are doing that right now. They're just walking across the auditorium. Nate's walking across the auditorium and just leading people to Jesus. This is what it's about. Amen. So today is the final week and the final um, message of Just Walk Across the Room. And in a little while, you can see the title there. But uh, how many of us just have been enjoying the testimonies of people who have been stepping out of their comfort zone and just going to talk to people. How many of you have been, been attempting that? Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's just a great, great thing to, to see you stepping out and doing that. And how many of us are praying that the testimonies will continue long after this series is over? Let's make this a part of just our life and our culture at New Hope. Amen? Let's just make this part of our lives and let the testimonies continue. So even though the series is over... Um, our new conviction, our new conviction to walk across the room is a permanent part of our hearts. Amen? This is what Jesus did for us. Amen? He, he walked across the universe to get to us. So we can sure walk across 
a floor, you know, to get to another person and share with them the love of the Lord. So let's kind of review what the series has been about. Uh, as you probably remember, in week one, we talked about the greatest gift that each of us possesses, which is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are convinced, in that message we talked about, would, would you not agree that if a person gets to know Christ, their life would be better, amen? Their life would be better with Jesus than without Jesus. And so we're willing, knowing that, now they don't know that, but we know that, so we're willing to step out of our comfort zone and walk into what zone? The, <laughs> it is, it is the Jesus zone, Bob, yeah, but we were calling it the zone of the unknown, remember that, the zone of the unknown, because we don't know what's going to happen next. Are they going to listen to us? Will they be open to us? Will, will they reject us? Don't know. It's the zone of the unknown, but we're willing to take that chance. We're willing to take that chance. And, and the most powerful thing about this is that it's the Holy Spirit that is leading us. So the Lord is going to lead you in this. When he prompts you to go walk across the room and go talk to that person, he's also going to lead you in this conversation. And as we were saying, you don't have to be the person that actually leads them to the Lord in that moment. Maybe you're the person that takes them from negative 50 to negative 40. Now, we pray that maybe you'll be the person that takes them from negative 10 to, you know, zero to positive one and into the kingdom of God. But maybe the Lord says, no, I just want you to, to get him a little bit closer. Just bring him from negative 50 to negative 40. We're good with that. So it's okay if they don't receive the Lord in that moment. But you made the difference that the Lord wanted you to make in that moment. That's key. Amen? So that's what we're talking about is that the Holy Spirit is going to lead. We'll come back to that in just a second. So that's week one, the greatest gift. In week two, we talked about um, 3D living. Remember the three Ds? Do you guys remember what those were? They were discovering a relationship or, I'm sorry, developing a relationship like on purpose. So getting to know people uh, intentionally. So developing relationships, the first D is develop. The second D is discover their stories. And as you discover their story, you can share your story, and then you tell them about his story. So discovering stories, talking story. And the last is discerning what the Holy Spirit wants to do next. So that's living in 3D. Those are the three Ds. And then remember last week, we're talking about the power of story and just the unique way in which the Lord worked in your life and how powerful that is as you share with another person. And uh, so sometimes that's what it'll take is for them to hear about how the Lord worked in your life. So today... The message is called Grander Vision Living. And it's our prayer that we're going to leave convinced of what is the most important thing in life that we can do. So how many of us growing up in Hawaii, we're surrounded by the Pacific Ocean, so you like to fish. Anybody like to fish in here? Yeah? Any, any fishermen out there? All right. Yeah. Uh, for me, I'm kind of like a small game kind of a guy, you know, just tilapia, one little stream, or Wailua, <laughs> you know, just small fish. Um, and so I'm not much of a fisherman at all. Now, Pastor Earl, he's the diver, you know, he's the fisherman. This reminds me of a story of a, a Portuguese man named Mano. Have you heard of this? So Mano, he decides that he wants to go ice fishing. So he goes and he digs a hole in the ice and he's about to let down his, his fishing line, but he hears this voice that says, there is no fish down there. So he kind of you know, picks up all his gear and he moves a few feet, digs another hole, and he's about to go fishing down that hole, but then he hears another voice say, there is no fish down there. All right, so he goes to another spot, digs another hole, and he hears that voice again. There's no fish down there. Now, at this point, Mano says, God, is that you? He goes, no, you Lolo. This is the rink manager. You're in Ice Palace. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not the only one that's not much of a fisherman. 
Now, wouldn't it be something, wouldn't it be something, and this has actually happened. The Lord in the Bible tells stories of how he suspends the laws of nature, it seems, and helps people do some pretty amazing things, and one of them is fishing. Now, how many of you would, would love it if the Lord would just tell you where the fish are? Yeah. Just tell you where the fish are, and then you go fish, and you go do them. Well, that's exactly what happens in Luke chapter 5, and this is the key passage of our message today. And let me read it for you. In Luke chapter 5, it says, One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. And he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them, and they were washing their nets. So stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, the owner, to push it out to deeper water. So he sat in the boat and talked to the crowds from there. Now when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon said, we worked hard all late last night and we caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Now, this is a story of Jesus calling his very first disciples to himself. And who were they? Were they the theologians? Were they the religious leaders? Nope. They were common, ordinary, garden variety fishermen. And with that group, they changed the world. And so that's what this message is about this morning. Write in your notes the first point there. Number one, don't drop your float unless Jesus is in the boat. All right, everybody say that together. Ready? Go. Don't drop your float unless Jesus is in the boat. So in Luke 5, it says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but okay, because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, the thing I love about Peter is that he never hesitates to speak his mind. You ever notice that? I mean, he's got foot in mouth disease. <laughs> Open mouth, insert foot. And basically, he just lets it go. You know, every, whatever he's thinking, he just says it. And so I imagine, you know, I mean, he can't reveal the whole thing to Jesus in this moment, but there's got to be a little frustration in him when Jesus tells him to do this. He's been working all night. And what was Jesus doing the night before? Probably asleep, tucked in bed. So I've been working all night, you've been in bed. And he's probably thinking that in his head, you know. And they just got finished pulling in their nets and cleaning them. So they just cleaned the nets. And now Jesus is saying, go back out and drop the nets back into the Sea of Galilee once again. And Peter's probably going, what does this carpenter think he knows about fishing? I am the professional fisherman here. All right? I've been doing this all my life. I've been living, you know, along this coast, this shore here, and this, this Sea of Galilee right here is my home turf. What does this guy know? He's a carpenter. Does he have any idea who he's talking to? Me, Peter, the fisherman. Besides, I already know today the fish aren't biting. That happens sometimes. How many of us have ever felt the need to educate Jesus? Anybody ever? Yeah, you ever feel that? Lord, don't you have any idea what's going on here? I don't know if you noticed this morning, but uh, our nets, uh, there are no fish in those nets. This, that's not fish that we're pulling out of our nets. It's limu, all right? It's seaweed. Nothing in the nets. The fish aren't biting. There are no fish. 
So sometimes we feel like we've got to educate Jesus. You know, I, I would reach out to that person, but I don't think that they're, that, that person's not going to be open. That person, that person's never gone to church in a long, long time. Why would they listen to me? You know, so sometimes we, we do, do that coworker, you know, that I know the Lord, you want me to go be friends with that person, but that person is the most closed person to church ever. This person is never going to come to the Lord, ever. So we got to educate Jesus. Don't you know, Lord, that person is never going to believe in you. How many of us have ever done that? So here, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that. I love Peter's heart, though. He goes, I don't think this is going to work. I have my doubts. But because you say so, I will. And, and I think that's the key. Because whenever we say something like, Lord, don't you know what that person is like or who that person is? They're never going to come to church. They're never going to come to Jesus. What we're doing is we are making the decision for them. You're making the decision for them not to come to the Lord. You made that decision, not them, you. You see? So it's important not to make the decision for another person. Let them make their own decision. Amen? How many of us are glad that somebody let us make our own decision about Jesus? Yeah. Right? So someone let you decide. They talked to you. They invited you to put your faith in Jesus. And you said, yes. I'll put my faith in the Lord and I'll come to church. All right. So maybe as we've been talking about walking across the room, you've had doubts. Um, maybe you know, you think you know your friends and uh, the fish just aren't biting. But the key is to let Jesus in the boat and he'll make all the difference. Let Jesus in the boat. So that's when we say the Holy Spirit will lead us in talking to other people about, about our faith. Now, in Luke chapter 5, it says, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. So there was so much fish that was caught that two boatloads of fish, two boatloads uh, began to sink. They never saw a catch like that before. I mean, it was a miracle catch. And so this carpenter, who apparently knew nothing about fishing, um, showed them a, a little thing or two about catching fish. And the key was that the Lord was in the boat. Yeah, hey, I want to I show you some pictures. And this was, for me, like I said, I'm usually like a tilapia guy, you know? I mean, that's kind of the, the best I've, I've done. But um, a friend of mine one day invited me to go fishing. So there was me, I think this was around 2007 or so, it was years and years and years ago, and this was my best day fishing ever. My best day ever. So that's Aku, right? Does anyone, does anyone know your fish? Okay, that's Aku. Okay, thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm just catching, I, we caught 16 of these. 16. And um, I was like having the time of my life. But then that's not all we caught that day. So the next thing is, a little bit later on, we landed this. So we're, we're in a, I'm in a friend's boat, okay? And uh, we landed this mahi-mahi. Oh, my gosh. was ono. And that, I thought, well, that's the biggest thing I ever caught. And then we just kept on going. And later on that day, yes, sir, a marlin. We caught that. Now, you're thinking, D did you reel that in, Pastor Mike? No. We pressed the button, and there was an automatic reeler. There's a motor on that. <laughs> Look. There's a motor on that reel right there. You press the button, and it just kind of reels it in for you. I mean, it could not have been easier. I thought, first marlin ever caught. It was so easy. <laughs> That's not all. Check out the last thing that we caught that day. That's a 167-pound ahi, yellowfin tuna. On the way home at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we, we, caught, we caught this. And that right there, that's gas money right there. That paid for our whole day, that thing right there. Now, I have to tell you, like I said, I'm a tilapia guy, right? So I don't catch fish like this. But I happen to be in somebody's boat. Alex Pacheco. <laughs> that's not Alex. That's another guy named Al, but uh, uh, two guys named Al. And so there was Al. Alex, he's the one taking the picture, actually. 
and he knew exactly where to go. He had this like route planned out. So this is the big island, right? And he was taking this out and um, he knew exactly what kind of lures. And I said, wow, this is a really interesting kind of lure you got here, Alex. He goes, yeah, I made them myself. It's a top secret. I go, whoa, okay, so no pictures or anything. He used a special kind of lure. And then, um, you know, we, sure enough, we went out. He knew exactly, you know, where the buoy was, where all the aqua were going to be. And then he kind of went out. And that's, then we landed the mahi. Then we landed the marlin. Then we landed this on the way in. He just knew exactly where to go. He knew exactly what to do. And so the reason I had the, biggest, the best day ever fishing is because I had Alex Pacheco in the boat. <laughs> now, how many of us know when you have Jesus in your boat, you're going to have some good days? You're going to have some good days. Amen. Like, like for me, like um, I, I was a youth guy before, a youth pastor. I had never pastored a church before, never. But the Lord said, I want you to go just hang out with Wayne Cordero. I said, Wayne Cordero? I mean, who's Wayne Cordero? I don't even know this guy, you know. This is back in mid-90s. And I had no idea what was going to happen next, but Jesus was going to be in our boat. <laughs> and that church went to like 3,000 people in one year. And then I, we planted from that church, and I know there's like three campuses in three different cities, and, and we're like just, we're just ordinary guys. We're like fishermen, right? Just regular people. But Jesus in the boat makes all the difference in the world, amen? That's what we're talking about. So, do not drop your float unless you get Jesus in the boat. <laughs> so just do what he says. Just do what he says and you'll be good. Number two, I love this. Don't simply net dollars, net destinies. How many of us know, let me, get, let me just say straight up what this is about. When you help someone come to the Lord, you will change their entire future. Their whole future is going to go in a different direction. You will have altered their destiny. Now, Peter's probably thinking, wow, become a fisher of men, a fisher of people. But see, fishing, this is all I know. Uh, and, and, and he's like so stunned about what just took place. He goes before Jesus, and, and he actually tells him to leave. Remember that? He says, Lord, go away from me. I, I'm, I'm not qualified to be in the same boat with you. I'm a sinful man. I mean, most of us have had that feeling like, Lord, why, why would you ever use me? But the Lord says this, and I love this. For, for anyone who's ever felt like, you know, God, you can use these other guys, you know, these pastors or whatever. I don't think you'll ever be able to use me. I want you to hear the Lord say this to you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm there with you. I will never leave you. I will never leave your side as you go talk to people, all right? And he says, from now on, you're not just going to be doing this fishing business for dollars. You're going to be catching people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, and what do they do? Left everything, dropped their nets, got rid of their boats, and they followed Jesus. So after this miraculous catch, Jesus pitches his vision to these common, ordinary local fishermen to become his very first disciples. And he says, men, tilapia is great, <laughs> but you want to catch the big ones? I'm talking about fishing for people, human-sized ones. And so Jesus was elevating their vision in that moment. He was saying, instead of like just going for the manini stuff, right? Let's go for, let's go for the best of all. Let's make a difference in somebody's life. Now, here's what I want you to notice. What's really cool is, in this passage, Jesus never condemns their passion and their call for fishing, right? He doesn't say, oh, you know, you fishermen, blah, blah, blah. No, instead, he, he encourages them to take those, that skill that they have and use it for the kingdom. So these guys, were, these guys were fishermen, and Jesus knew that. But Jesus didn't tell them to give up fishing. He just showed them 
that they were fishing for the wrong thing. So, church, how many of us know that God wants us to use our skills and our abilities and our passions in a mighty way to reach other people? That doesn't mean that you have to give up your skills or your passions or abilities. Instead, write in your notes, Jesus doesn't condemn your gifts. He redeems them so that you will use them for his kingdom. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. That's awesome. <laughs> so he's saying to these guys, don't stop fishing. You've been fishing your whole life. You're good at it. It's what I created you to do. But now I want you to use that knowledge and that experience and, and all, the thing that, all the things that you've learned and use it not for dollars, but for destinies. He wants us to win others. You know, it's said that um, Mark Twain, you know, the, the writer, uh, Huckleberry Finn, you know, those stories, um, he liked to go fishing to just relax. And, um, but the thing about it was he just wanted to just chill, you know, when he was by the river. So, in fact, um, he, he was so intent on relaxing, he didn't even want to catch any fish. He just wanted to drop his line in there. In fact, catching a fish would be kind of like a bother to him. He's like, oh, okay, now I got this fish on my line. Oh, now I got to deal with this fish. And so what he did was, because he didn't want to be bothered at all, in fact, the reason why he did this is because he felt like if he would just be sitting there just relaxing and doing nothing, then the people would think, look, he's a lazy bum, right? So he kind of pretended like he was fishing, so no one would bother him. And so what he would do is, he would actually put his line in the water with no hook. And that way he could just like chill and look like he was doing something. People go, look, Mark Twain, he's fishing. Don't bother him, he's, he's trying to catch fish. But actually he was just relaxing. Church, how many of us know that we can become like that? Many believers can have their pull in the water and have the appearance of a disciple of Christ, but there's no hook on the end, so there's no intention of actually catching fish. They're just chilling, relaxing. And that isn't what Jesus had in mind. Amen? Amen. The Lord says, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. He wants to redeem your gifts and use them for the kingdom. Now, remember Moses when he encountered God on Mount Sinai, right? And the Lord had something big in, in, in store for him. And the, and the Lord was calling him out, telling him to step out from being a shepherd to being a deliverer of Israel. And he's, and he's now standing before the Lord and he's got this shepherd's staff in his hand. And in order for God to use Moses, he had to surrender everything. So his shepherd business, and so he goes to Moses and he says, Moses, I got a huge plan for you, but you're going to need to surrender everything. So show me what you have in your hand. And he showed him his staff. He said, I want you to lay that staff before me. And he's thinking now, okay, but this staff represents my livelihood. This staff represents everything I've ever known. This staff re represents my, my life now, and I, I need this, you know, to do my shepherd thing. But now the Lord is asking him to lay it down before him. That, that was a huge moment for, for Moses, and that's exactly what he did. He laid it down before the Lord, and he offered it to God. Now what happens next is awesome, because the Lord says, okay, now that you've laid it down before me, your staff before me, I want you to take it up again. Huh? Okay. And so he picks it up. And the Lord says, now this staff will become my rod. And it belongs to God now. It belongs to me. Now, no longer was it a simple shepherd's staff. Now it was the rod of God Love. in the hand of Moses. Before, he used it to corral sheep. But now the Lord would use it to split oceans. Before, it was like a simple walking stick but now it would become a plague summoner to deliver the people from Israel, from Egypt. So church, when you give God what's in your hand, he will give you what's in his. Amen? Amen. And his presence will be with you. So 
when God gives you what's in his hand, you will step out into your destiny and you won't be just working for dollars. You'll be working to redeem destinies, people's lives, people's uh, families and jobs and abilities. Uh, I really love that testimony that Mel shared at the, at the funeral uh, a couple nights ago. If, um, if you weren't there, it was so powerful because we were honoring Kimo who had just passed away. And Mel shared the story, Melanie Ota from, uh, from Milani campus. And she shared the story of how when she and her husband Doug um, you know, that were not in church at all. They were invited to go play softball, and Kimo was the coach. So he was a softball coach. And so they go to um, the, this first game, right? And uh, at first, Doug is not even sure he's going to go. But last minute, he decides to go, and Melanie's like, oh, praise God, he's going to come. But um, when it gets to the baseball field or the softball field, I guess he's feeling a little nervous, and so he decides to take out a mar you know, some marijuana. So he's in the dugout and he's smoking marijuana. Now the whole dugout's like filled with this marijuana smoke, right? I mean, everyone could smell it, and Melanie's like praying, God, please like blow the smoke down that way. You know, this is so embarrassing. Oh my gosh. And he's thinking, these, these church people are gonna judge me, and this is the very, this is the end, and, and here comes chemo, and he comes walking in. And you know he could smell it, right? He could see what's going on. He could see Doug, you know, with his bloodshot eyes, you know, and Melanie's like, <laughs> sorry. And, they, and, you know, they're not married, and they got four kids, and, they, you know, they smell like weed, and, uh, you know, they were just, they were broke, and their lives were a mess. But Kimo looks past all of that stuff, and he says, hey, anybody want to play some softball? <laughs> And so they, they get up, they go play up. No judgment, no condemnation. And I gotta tell you, that made a huge difference for Doug and Mel. Because what happened to them after was Mel comes to Jesus, and then the kids come to the Lord, and then Doug comes to Jesus, and then Doug goes through this whole spiritual transformation where I can tell you to this day, he's been eight years clean and sober. And the two of them, praise God. The, the two of them now are financially awesome. They just bought a house. And can you see what happened when Kimo walked across, you know, the field, right, into that dugout and did not, you know, didn't start spewing any condemnation or anything. He just said, hey, you guys are so welcome here. Let's go play some softball. And that, that little thing right there, totally changed their destiny. And this is what we're talking about. This is what's happening for real in this church. It's so awesome. So finally, number three, write in your notes. Don't settle for manini catch. Okay? Don't settle for manini. Catch the real deal. So manini is, you know, the small fish. That's the kind you throw back, right? So don't settle for the throwaway fish. Let's go for the real deal. In our story this morning, we read about the beginning of Jesus' ministry and how he chose the first disciples ever in Luke chapter 5. Well, here's something really interesting. In John chapter 21, if you fast forward, this is at the end of, of Jesus' earthly ministry, and he has died on the cross. He's been resurrected, right? And what's happened is the, the guys are like a mess, okay, because they just saw, you know, him get crucified. And uh, so... They don't know what to do now. And so you know what they do? They decide to do? Go back to fishing. This is what it says. It says, it says, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. So Jesus is gone. You know, they don't know what's going to happen with their lives now. They think the dream has ended. And Peter says this, I'm going to go out and do some fishing. He's going back to fishing. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, and they got in the boat. And that night, they caught nothing. Can you see what's about to happen here? <laughs> and early in the morning, Jesus, he stands on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that that was Jesus. 
And he calls out to them and he says, friends, have you caught any fish? And they answered, no. He said, well, throw your net on the other side of the boat, the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the huge catch of fish. And then Jesus, well, John realizes, hey, I think that's Jesus on the shore. That's got to be the, this, this whole thing is looking very, very familiar. They're having like a deja vu moment right now. It's like, okay, I think I know what's going on here. And John looks on the shore and says, that's got to be Jesus. And Peter, you know, rips off his shirt and he dives in. He starts swimming for the Lord. He says, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. And uh, so they go. And then when they get there, they, they have this huge catch of fish once again. And um, they, uh, they, they, they gather around Jesus who is, you know, cooking something, you know, by the fire, cooking some fish already and some bread. And they go, well, I can't believe it's you. It's you. You're back. He says, yep, I'm back. Now, the guys had lost hope in that moment because they saw Jesus get crucified. They thought the dream is over. But Jesus reminds them once again. Now, he doesn't notice that when he sees them, he does not condemn them or um, rebuke them or say, wow, thanks a lot for denying me back there three times, you know, or, well, Judas, thank you. Well, Judas is not there, but thank you all for, like, abandoning me when I needed you the most. None of that, right? None of that happened. Instead, he takes Peter to the side, and, and he knows what Peter did, denied him three times, right? So he's going to give him a chance right now to redeem himself. And he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says to the Lord, yes, Lord, I do. Well, go feed my sheep. And then he asks him a second time, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I do, Lord. Go tend to my lambs. Then he says again, for the last time, because he denied him three times, right? So a third time he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, I know that you know everything, and you know I love you. Yep, I know you do. Now go feed my sheep. Now, when this took place, what happened was Peter was redeemed, and all the apostles were redeemed. They had lost hope. They had kind of lost the vision, but Jesus now came back and restored that vision for them once again. And he helped them to see that, that the most important thing they could do in their life was not to go back to their fishing, but now to go catch the real deal, amen? To go back to the original mission, which was to go catch people. You know, as we closed this morning, I want you to imagine that um, you've got like a, a marking pen, okay? And this marking pen um, is red. And with that marking pen, you can write on all the things that you see around you and that you own, and you can write the word temporary. Like on my, my, Mac, my MacBook right here, I just write the word temporary on here. On this, this, um, this podium, I just write the word temporary. Why? Because it's all going to go away one day. This stage, I just write temporary on this. Okay? Um, my car outside, I just write temporary on that because that's going to go away one day. Everything that you have on your shirt, right? All your, all your clothes, your house, you can just write temporary on everything. But there is one thing in this room. Now you take out a different color pen, right? Take out a, um, let's say it's green, a green pen. And with that pen, you can mark on the one thing in this room that is eternal. And that is the person to your right, you can write on their arm, eternal. 
On the person to your left, you can write on their forehead, eternal. You can just tattoo all the people in this room because every person in this room is not temporary, is eternal. And that's the only thing in this room that will last forever is the people. And that's what the Lord is telling us this morning is don't go just for dollars, but go for destinies, amen? And, and, and he's saying, don't go for the mini, mini, mini stuff. Go for what's eternal. And I'm going to be with you every step of the way, he says. I will not leave you or forsake you. My spirit will be with you every step of the way. Let's all stand together for closing prayer. Now, next week, I want you to know that uh, we're going to start a new series, okay? And it's called EQ. Now, what we're thinking is this. We've got like this new heart to reach out to people and to help people come to Jesus. And so we'll be bringing our friends to church, you know, inviting them to church and so forth. And we have to ask this question, see, this honest question. What will they find when they come to church? Uh, a lot of people are thinking that when they come to church, they're going to find perfect people. Is there anybody in here perfect? <laughs> yeah, in your spirit, right, bro? In your spirit you are. I get you, yeah. But we still kind of make a mistake every now and then, like stuff that we say or stuff that we do. But in your spirit, you are righteous and you are perfect. But every now and then, what I've noticed is that even church people will make a mistake. And what's important there is that we go through this process of understanding how the Lord uh, makes us holy. So we're perfect in Jesus in our spirit, but then that has to like make itself, uh, you know, like known in every part of us, in our words, in our minds, in our bodies, and that's a process. And so when people come to church and they see people, church people, right? They see church people, like saying the wrong thing, making mistakes, like doing all kinds of weird things. They're like, wow, bunch of hypocrites. You know, I mean, this is not what I thought. And so we're going to, like, just be real with everyone next week. This is a series called Emotional Quotient, or EQ. And we're going to say that both Christians and people who are not Christian yet have to go through this process of transformation where the Lord transforms us. So that when they come, they realize, well, they never said they were perfect. But we do know the Lord Jesus who can transform us from the inside out. Amen? We do know him, and it, that is for real. And he does change lives. And we are never going to be the same again. But it's a, it's a journey that we're going to go on. And so if they, you know, if they see believers not acting the way that they thought that they would believe, they will understand that we're all on this journey to be more like Jesus. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord, I want to say thank you for this morning, and I want to thank you, God, that this in this series, you just imparted to us like a whole new heart, a, a new passion, God, for what is on your heart and what is on your heart are all the people in our lives. I want you to think right now for, about the people in your life, the people who don't know the Lord yet. And yeah, sometimes they're a little hard to talk to. Maybe they don't want to talk to you. But we're praying for them right now. And we are deciding right now that we are not going to decide for them that they're not going to come to Jesus or not going to come to church. Instead, we're going to pray, Lord, believing with all of our heart that their, their lives can change because we saw how you changed our lives so we know you can change their life. And so do it, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you just work in a very, very powerful way in their lives. Hallelujah. And as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, maybe as you're, you're listening today, you're, you're asking yourself, hmm, I wonder if I have a relationship with Jesus. Do I know the Lord in that personal way like you're talking about? And if today you're not absolutely sure that if you were to die right now, you'd go to heaven, you can be sure. 
by putting your faith in the Lord who died, died for you on the cross. And so what did he do when he did that? He took away all of your sin. He took away everything you've ever done, all your past mistakes, and he deleted them on the cross. He just, he just like, select all, press delete. And ev- everything, your entire past is completely washed clean. And now you have a brand new hard drive, a whole new life in Jesus. If there's anyone like that this morning and you're saying, yep, that's me. I like, like a new hard drive this morning. I'd like all of my past to be deleted and a new life in Jesus. Just by the uplifted hand, just raise your hand to say, that's me, Lord. Hallelujah. Good. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see that hand. I see you there. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Good. Praise God. Okay, let's pray this prayer. Now, repeat after me. Just say, Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross to take away my sin. I have sinned, Lord. I admit that. I made some mistakes. And I confess that to you. That means I agree with you. And I turn away from my sin now. From my old life. And I turn to you. Thank you for your forgiveness. I receive your forgiveness. Thank you for taking away all of my sin and giving me a brand new heart. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live for you with all I have. And I can reach out to other people in my life who also need you like I need you. In Jesus' name I pray. All God's children said. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. That's awesome. Now watch how the Lord leads us this week. Amen. So stay connected with him and just, you don't have to make anything happen. You you just don't miss it when it happens. You know what I mean? (laughs) Hallelujah. Let's sing. Let's sing as we go.